Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today is a story of how a golden bullet almost destroyed a space shuttle. The year was 1999. The flight STS-93, the 95th launch of the space shuttle program. This would be the first one commanded by a woman, Eileen Collins, who had previously flown a couple of times, and she would be trusted with the heaviest payload ever launched on a space shuttle. The Chandra X-ray Observatory and its inertial upper stage required to inject it into its target orbit. This would be 20 tons of hardware and no other payload would be as heavy. In part because of the heavy payload, the crew was smaller than usual. Only five were on board. And carrying all of this would be Columbia, NASA's oldest orbiter. And it had been showing its age. It had, you know, show, got a bit of wear and tear. There were a few things that were a little iffy with it. And, you know, it's really important to keep in mind that for a launch of any rocket to be successful, 100 things have to go right. But for a failure, only one thing has to go wrong. The Space Shuttle Orbiter is propelled by three RS-25 engines, and they are still considered to be exceptionally good engines. The plumbing is pretty complicated. Roughly speaking, what happens is the liquid hydrogen is first fed in through the engine through cooling channels throughout the structure. In particular, the walls of the combustion chamber and the nozzle have a liquid hydrogen flowing through them, and the heat of the combustion will vaporize this. Now, the vaporized hydrogen is then passed back through a turbine where it's combined with a small amount of oxygen to create energy that then drives the pumps. Finally, these hot exhaust gases are then passed through to the main combustion chamber where they flow through an injection system where the rest of the oxygen is added and that is there where you get your thrust. Now, in this final mixing stage, the oxygen has to run down a series of small pipes where the hot hydrogen gases run over the top and that heats the oxygen. These pipes are called oxygen injector posts, and there would be about 600 of these in every engine. These injector posts would have to be inspected after every single flight, and any, if any of them looked like they might be showing some fatigue, they would have to be disabled and rendered inoperative. An engine could operate just fine with a few of these posts disabled, and over the lifetime of the shuttle program, over 200 would be modified in this way. If a post would break off during the engine firing, it would be catastrophic and it would almost certainly lead to the destruction of the engine and probably the loss of the shuttle and crew. So engineers would disable these posts by wedging a gold pin into the root of the post. In the case of STS-93, one of the engines had a disabled post, and when the engine started, that gold pin came free, and it was forced down the post by the pressure of the gas behind it. It would have emerged with great speed and energy into the combustion chamber like a bullet. But the fury of that contained explosion in, in there just deflected this chunk of metal around like it was a leaf on the wind. It curved through the throat and impacted on the inside of the nozzle extension. If you remember, I mentioned that the hydrogen is first running through the walls of the nozzle. The nozzle isn't just a simple sheet of metal. It's actually over 1,080 loops of metal tubes all welded together. And just think about this for a moment. This video is you know, 1080p, that's 1080 pixels. Now imagine welding every row of pixels together. These pipes carry the liquid hydrogen to cool everything, and on one, one side the engine bell is so cold that ice will form, while on the interior the exhaust is hot enough to boil iron. Supposedly, the engineers looked into failures, and they determined that if five of these adjacent pipes were damaged, then the loss in cooling in that spot would quickly result in a burn-through and the destruction of the engine, loss of the orbiter, loss of the spacecraft, and the crew. That gold pin, when it impacted, tore open three. You can actually see in this image where the hydrogen was leaking out into the exhaust, Naively, you might think that this would lead to fuel being used up faster and the engine being at risk of running out of hydrogen before it reached orbit. And this would be very bad. Hydrolox engines all run fuel-rich because unburnt hydrogen is very light and it makes the engine more efficient. But also, having the reaction being non-stoichiometric, that is, not the perfect ratio, keeps the uh, reaction burning cooler. 
If the fuel ratio actually changes to include more oxygen, it'll get hotter. So this can be very bad, for example, if the fuel supply starts to tail off and the oxygen continues to flow at full speed. That will slide your mixture ratio towards stoichiometric. Things will overheat. There'll be no cooling and all that e excess oxygen will start to attack the engine. So when loading the space shuttle, they always made sure the fuel tank would have extra oxygen compared to the hydrogen to make sure the oxygen would always be the thing that would burn out first. Of course, the RS-25 engines were controlled by computers with an array of sensors that would make sure the engine was running correctly. They could sense something was wrong. However, because the hydrogen flow sensors were located upstream from the leak, it couldn't see that hydrogen was leaking from the system. What it could see was that the chamber pressure had dropped. So in response, it opened the oxygen valves a little more to increase the amount of thrust. Now this increased the uh, change the mixture ratio and as a result, everything got hotter. In fact, that 0.3% leak of hydrogen led to 50% of the safety margin being used up in the engine. And after the engines, of course, there is mission control. Normally, mission control would be right on top of this kind of thing, trying to diagnose the problem. But this was not the only problem on this launch. 300 meters. Lift off confirmed. Message. Copy lift off. Call up, 3104. Right, control 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 right, booster lost control, lost center engine A, right engine B looks like something on AC1. Copy that. The engineer on the propulsion console was focused on a big red warning light, telling him that one of the boosters had no hydraulic fluid. The boosters use hydraulics to gimbal the nozzles and steer the launch vehicle. Without this, the shuttle would go out of control and in a worst case scenario might start heading for a populated area. Fortunately, this fluid indicator was merely the symptom of a cable that had come loose during the first few seconds of launch. The astronauts on board, they didn't see any of this, but what they did see was a warning light telling them that their fuel cell pH was wrong. The fuel cells on the space shuttle generate electrical power by reacting hydrogen and oxygen in a controlled manner. Fuel cell pH indicated that the fuel cell was breaking down, and that controlled reaction could quickly become an uncontrolled reaction, with explosive consequences. Again, this was a false reading. But the real problem was still pretty dramatic. An electrical cable was shorting out, and phantom electrical signals had triggered the fuel sensor before the circuit breakers had shut it down to isolate the fault. The cable had been slowly damaged over 20 years' flight because a screw head had a small burr in it, probably because some overzealous engineer had tightened it too much during assembly. Anyway, that cable represented one of the redundant power buses, and when it went offline, it also took two of the engine controllers offline. Of course, each engine has two computers, a main computer and a backup. The center engine was forced to switch to its backup after its primary computer lost power. Either computer was capable of controlling the engine, but the primary computer sent more detailed telemetry, so mission control lost most of the telemetry for the center engine, and another was running way hotter than it should. There was also another consequence of the computer failure in the center engine. The computers each have their own set of sensors, and normally they would average this data. In the case of the center engine, the backup computer's pressure sensor was reading high, and when the primary computer shut down, the backup chose to slightly throttle down the center engine because it thought it was running too high. Now, I've heard that this may actually have been a stroke of luck that reduced the overall oxygen consumption and saved the mission. But anyway, in the end, the flurry of failures didn't cause a mission failure. The shuttle squeaked into orbit with the engine shutting down 150 milliseconds early due to low oxygen. The vehicle was within 15 feet per second of its target speed, and the mission subsequently proceeded as normal, with no extra Ohms-1 burn needed to get into orbit. After ditching the external tank and running through post-launch checklists, one of my favorite mission control exchanges can be heard. Yikes. You bet. Incur. We don't need any more of these. How about that? 
As for the crew, they didn't have much they could do to remedy the situation. The only action they took in response to the situation was to disable the AC bus sensors. This would prevent the possibility of any of the other two electrical buses going offline automatically if there were other transient signals or glitches. The other thing that astronauts do during the ascent is prepare for abort scenarios. Many of the calls to Capcom to crew is going down the list changing the modes of the aborts system. If the orbital underspeed had been greater, they might have had to burn a lot of Ohm's fuel to make up the difference. Beyond that, they might have been forced to abort and land without deploying the payload. There's two possibilities that might have come here. One would have been a transatlantic abort where they didn't quite make it into orbit. They would skim across the Atlantic and land in Africa. But if they got into a low orbit that couldn't be sustained, there's a abort once around option where they would fly around and land back in the US. And from what I can tell, Chandra was a very sensitive device. Had it been returned to Earth in the payload, it would have been torn down and rebuilt to ensure that it was still working before it was relaunched. But these days, it's still working. It's been going for 19 years of its five-year mission. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.